the physician is supposed to fax the form to the appropriate company or FDA. If the patient is on multiple medications, then in theory, the physician is supposed to fax such a form to each pharma company. Companies enter the data into their pharmacovigilance databases for review and analysis. The sponsor or company may call back to the investigator with follow-up questions for additional data. The manufacturer has reporting requirements to the FDA, which enters and tracks the data in its own systems as well. I think you can understand why there is under-reporting and time-consuming time accumulation of data and analyses. Again, one solution is to have access to more data through EHR databases and insurance claims databases. Using more sophisticated analytical techniques, there is an opportunity to find important safety signals. Of course, there's always the possibility of false positive findings, and again, any safety findings must be balanced with the benefits as well. There are two major initiatives in this regard, one with FDA and another with a consortium of pharma, NIH, and FDA and academia. The first initiative is the consortium known as OMOP, the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership. This effort is working with a handful of large databases involving data from patient care. The consortium has a sophisticated governance structure and a project plan to assess the utility of these data sources as well as analytical methodologies to find safety signals. Time does not permit a full description of this effort, but the, here is some of the information that may help any interested parties familiarize themselves with this project. I should note that the OMOP project is at the present time sponsoring an open competition, the OMOP Cup, for analytically interested researchers to develop and test algorithms for finding relationships between drugs and medical outcomes in such observational data. The second initiative in this regard is mandated of FDA based on recent legislation by Congress. It is an active surveillance system known as Sentinel rather than the passive MedWatch system in process. It is similar to OMOP in that FDA is working with a variety of database sources in creating a sustainable system and process for aggregating data and results from, for signal detection efforts. It is meant to be a more real-time system for identifying potential safety issues. Of course, the value of finding safety issues sooner is obvious. In both of these cases of using accumulating data from healthcare, it's being analyzed for potential safety signals with the mindset that a confirmatory analyses need to follow since the risk of false positive findings is very real. Now I would like to present a concept of safety surveillance that is even more real time, simpler and cost effective for collecting safety information, which I will call Sentinel 2.0. One might call it Sentinel 2.0 since it is perhaps the next generation of prospectively and actively collecting standardized safety information. We will start with EHRs where clinical care is delivered. Then imagine the MedWatch form or other standard data collection form defined by FDA or CDISC embedded within the EHR. If a physician wishes to report an adverse event, they can call up the standard electronic form with the EHR. Selected fields of the form are pre-populated with data from within the EHR, making it easier for the physician to complete the form. The adverse event information is simultaneously transmitted to the EHR at the site and to a common central repository owned by FDA. This reporting does not require the physician to know the fax number of the pharma company or multiple pharma companies or FDA. This would allow FDA to monitor truly in real time accumulating data as it is happening in the clinical care setting with no lag time in reporting or aggregation of data across compounds or therapeutic classes of drugs. Controlled access to the data can be made available to healthcare practitioners who may want or need information relevant to patient care. Manufacturers can access data related to their products to monitor and analyze safety reports. Other researchers from academia could also make requests for access if they have legitimate research proposals to investigate safety hypotheses, somewhat like the NIH model for funded research. By making the standard adverse event form and the submission functionality a requirement for CCHIT certified EHRs, adverse event reporting could be significantly simplified and improved. This approach is being investigated in some pilot work between Eli Lilly, the IU Medical Center, and Regan Streif Institute, as well as the ASTER project being done by Pfizer, Partners Healthcare, and Brigham and Women's Hospital. The advantages to this approach are many, but most notably, safety reports are easier to complete and a standard form and resulting data allow for more useful analyses. As EHRs are adopted, 
There is a natural market-driven process for spreading this reporting capability. The options for independent analysis by academics lends credibility to industry and FDA assessments. The entire approach improves patient outcomes, public trust, operational efficiency through an integrated standardized electronic system of reporting. As you can see, there's a lot of our future that depends heavily on data standards for moving and integrating data. I believe this quote aptly describes our current industry, nationally and internationally. There's a huge amount of effort needed to define such standards. However, the payoff is enormous. Since I started with a reference to Michelangelo, freeing his sculpted figures embedded within stone, I will end with another Michelangelo perspective and an encouragement to us all. The danger is not that we aim too high and miss, but that we aim too low and achieve. I suggest that we must think big, start small, but grow fast so that we may improve the health of all people. Thank you for your time and attention, and I'll turn it back over to our chair, John Tooker, for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, to our distinguished panel for these uh, presentations now. We will now moderate questions from the board, and Steve, I'd appreciate if, if you would uh, moderate the questions. Okay. And then from a, a, our attendees here in the audience, we will also read aloud and direct any questions received online, and these will be aggregated in the panelist-only webinar chat uh, panel. So I'll begin by asking any of our board members if they have any questions of the panelists. Steve Finley? And then Janet Corrigan. Yeah, uh, that was just uh, very enlightening and terrific. Thank you very much. Um, what do you all think about the uh, sites like Patients Like Me and the research, quote unquote research, that is uh, beginning to uh, take place on through those sites and on those sites? So I'll take a stab at that, having just visited patients like me with some of my Eli Lilly colleagues in the last few weeks. Oh, the question was about sites like Patient Like Me. Um, if people aren't aware of that, I guess you can go to their website. But patients voluntarily give their information uh, in certain disease state areas, ALS, multiple sclerosis, um, mostly neuroscience diseases at this time. Um, but we see that as a source of several different um, pieces of valuable information for pharma companies. Uh, I guess one obvious one in no particular order is for, for patient enrollment in our clinical trials, for those who are developing drugs for Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, et cetera, um, having those patients be aware of how to get into clinical trials is one way to, to help make that connection. A second is to learn more about what, what is important to the patient, what outcomes are important to the patient. As we talk about translational medicine and genomic medicine and improved outcomes for individual patients, not just looking at overall population means, understanding what's important to them um, might help us develop data collection instruments or survey instruments that focus on what's the drug effect on these things that are most important to patients. So how can we develop, use some of that input from patients to develop such instruments and validate them and then embed them into our clinical research so that perhaps as we seek uh, drug approvals through FDA and other regulatory bodies, we may point to not just overall mean responses but outcomes that make a difference to patients. Um, I think the other aspect is as those patients enter more data, longitudinal data about themselves, and these people are freely volunteering data and as, as, as patients like me is standardizing some of that collection of data, you can begin to look at longitudinal uh, outcomes, maybe more long-term outcomes, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, use that information for sample sizes, for study design, and other kinds of things that are important to de developing and designing well-defined well clinical research. So I think those kind of social networking sites have a, have a wealth of information that can be used in a, in a number of facets to help pharmaceutical clinical research, but also help the patients that are uh, in that social network within those sites. Do any of our other panelists have a response to that question from Steve? Uh, yeah. No, I, I will just say that any opportunity we have to really make it clear to you know, to the patients, policymakers, whatever, how hard it is to do clinical research and come up with real, um, you know, knowledge about outcomes is important. And I think one of the things that you see on those sites, and even when they start, 
start to begin to collect some data, or they then sometimes will talk to the research community and say, Make, help us, how do we do that? You know, Because they want the answers too. Everybody wants the answers. Um, and the question is, is there any way that we can show greater partnership between the, you know, the patient community and the investigators, and that's one way to do it, I, I think is valuable. Thank you very much. I'll turn now to Janet Corrigan and then Kevin Hutchinson and then Michael Lardier and Laura Adams. Yeah, I thought it was a great set of uh, presentations as well. Um, I'd be interested in your perspective on uh, whether we have a real opportunity, I think we do uh, at this point in time, to think through a little bit better the types of outcomes data that we might want to collect and the extent to which we can drive towards standardization in certain areas, as well as to begin to delineate the types of outcome information that you probably want to collect on every patient at some point in time, outcome information that you want to routinely collect um, on patients with certain conditions, and it would be specific to it. And then, of course, there's probably very, very specific outcome information that you might want to collect as a part of a clinical trial. Um, in the quality measurement world, we're just, uh, we've, we are heavily into identifying performance measures that are outcomes uh, measures. Initially, it started with very crude outcome measures, uh, you know, alive, dead, mortality rates, things of that nature. Um, uh, but we are now, I think, beginning to look more at health functioning uh, measures, activities of daily living, which have been uh, available within long-term care settings for some time, uh, many different measures of pain, and dozens of measures of pain using all different skills, or different scales and approaches to assessing pain. And it strikes me that now really is the time as both performance measurement uh, moves much more aggressively to outcomes information uh, and as uh, clinical research clearly has the need that perhaps we could think about uh, standardizing where possible. Janet, I think that's a, a great question. I'll just take a very narrow slice of that. And um, the one element that I think um, needs a lot of focus on is just the research and the development of better measures. And uh, you know, we're talking about harmonizing standards, but in I think many cases we don't right have the measures that capture the, the kinds of data and be able to analyze them in long-term ways. And I'll give you a couple examples. One, um, I work principally in the area in pediatrics and some of the elements of interventions looking at long-term measures that we may not have the right kinds of uh, precision measures or tools to be able to capture in information that in a longitudinal way um, can do that. that. So one element is I think there's additional research and work needed to develop better standards and measurements and measurement tools for some of the longer-term uh, ways. The other sort of domain that I think is of interest is looking beyond the healthcare sphere about where we get information and evaluate outcomes so that it's not just in the healthcare setting, but I think you were alluding to in terms of long term care facilities, our work environment, and the ability to integrate non health systems related information into being able to measure some of the uh, impact of um, the health system. Um, so, th so those would be the two things that I think have been standing out to us as we're sort of looking at the broad frontier of um, longitudinal data collection through EHR systems is how do you begin to refine the precision measure measurement capabilities and as well as looking at other non-health system related uh, sources of information to provide more inference, particularly around economic impact. Just a quick comment, Janet. I think long-term outcomes um, will be very difficult to include in clinical research. At some point, you've got to have a finite trial and seek approval or, or whatever. But I do think EHR is playing an invaluable role for phase four studies, longer term observational studies, some of the large simple trials where we can collect that information over time. So um, that's kind of a short answer about where I think it could really help is kind of in the so-called phase four arena of clinical research. 